great to be here in Madrid. As Michael said, I uh, have this, I think, great job of a global brief of writing about international politics. It allows me to travel the world. Uh, so I was in Berlin earlier this week. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Washington, and then I'll be in Beijing at the end of the month. So it's easy for me to assume that what I do is intrinsically fascinating and that everybody should be very interested by it. But every now and then, you get a reality check. And um, I was talking to a colleague who works at the Daily Telegraph who've amazingly done some market research. And they, um, <laughs> so they, they tested their readers and said to them, you know, well, which bits of the paper do you read? And only 5% of readers read the foreign pages. Although, interestingly, 80% said they wouldn't buy a paper without foreign news in it. So they kind of like to feel it's there, but they don't necessarily want to read it. <laughs> um, and although, you know, the censorious person in me feels that, you know, that's very bad and they should be eating their greens and reading those stories on the Indian elections or whatever, I can understand, you know, we're all busy and they're not necessarily the most fascinating or relevant stories. So what I'd like to try and do while I give you in the next 30 minutes a kind of rapido tour of world political problems is occasionally come back and try and relate it to the lives that we all lead as citizens living here in Europe or perhaps in business. And if I don't, please do feel free to pull me back to that if uh, zoom off too high into the stratosphere of high politics. Um, now, I think one of the things about international politics is that it can be this sort of thing, sort of safe background music that you kind of ignore. And then every now and then, there'll be a big crisis that affects everybody. And I guess the archetype would, would have been 9-11, where I think most people in the room would have felt the reverberations of that, whether it's in increased security, whether it's the fact we ended up in wars as a consequence of that. And it's always difficult to, to be sure when we're going to reach a point where something becomes critical and you really have to pay attention. I had my own personal panic moment uh, in Athens a couple of years ago, actually. I was in, in Greece to cover the uh, Euro crisis there. And although that's an economic crisis, it also has strong political elements, which is why I was there. And I remember I spent a week kind of tramping around in the, the August heat talking to all the people involved, the government people, the bankers, the IMF. And at the end of it, I was really worried. Uh, it seemed to me that the banking system was on the point of collapse, that if it did collapse, that the euro would collapse and you would have social disorder in Greece and generally a very bad scene. And I remember going back to my hotel room and ringing my wife and saying, look, can you just sell all our shares? And... Um, <laughs> She had to break it to me, we don't actually have any shares. Uh, so, so, so that was a disappointing moment for me. But, um, but nonetheless, uh, actually, as it turned out, I was wrong about Greece, because although it looked like that crisis was going to go critical, and they've, they've, it's still not great, of course, but the, but the sense that the, the whole show was going to unravel, it didn't happen. So any, any judgments one, one makes, you have to be conscious that you're, you're always liable to be surprised by sudden turns of events. It's a point I'll return to when I come to the Middle East. Now, I said I'd give you a kind of quick tour of global problems. I was thinking if I was doing this a week ago, I probably would have restricted the places I talked about to three areas. I would have talked about the Middle East, talked about East Asia, and about Europe, since we are here in Europe. However, in a sign of how quickly things can move. I think, obviously, if you're looking at a political problem that could really affect us quite quickly, you have to look now across the Atlantic to the states where you've had the government shut down. And what is all that about? And will they finally see sense? Or could they actually drive the, the car over the cliff and, uh, and make America default on its debts so bad on the political, worry, the political partisanship there? Now, uh, many of you will be familiar with that old uh, Winston Churchill quote about the Americans always do the right thing in the end, having first exhausted all the alternatives. And, um, and I, I think that if I had to place a bet, I would bet that then in the end they will pull back. Because actually we've seen this movie before. There have been government shutdowns in the past, and there have been flirtations with uh, not renewing the American debt ceiling. Um, and in the end not without doing a bit of damage, because if you remember the last time they threatened to break the debt ceiling, actually Standard & Poor's reacted by downgrading America, which was well, a damaging thing to happen. But in the end, I think Congress doesn't want to live in a country whose credit is no longer worthwhile. And if you look, in periods when the system really looks threatened, they do tend to pull together. And the, the archetype for me was Lehman Brothers, uh, where 
the Republicans did vote to bail out the banks, although you know, this was ideological poison for them. They could see the consequences if they didn't act. And I think that um, if it looks like the full faith and credit of the US is really up for question and you begin to see panic in the financial markets, they'll, they'll see sense. But the risk is that they're playing a game of chicken at the moment, you know, who blinks first. And they feel able to play that game because at the moment, the consequences don't look too grave. And the risk is that they miscalculate, that they think they can keep playing it, and suddenly something happens, and before they know it, the situation's out of control. But my guess is that, although it looks highly dangerous, they will, they'll pull themselves together until the next time, when they'll do it all again in a few months' time. So that allows us to uh, return to the much more uh, serious, in a way, situation in the Middle East where people are actually dying, as opposed to posturing. Um, now, we're at an interesting juncture with, with the Middle East. If you think back to the, uh, the Arab Spring, which was January, February 2011, there was a surge of optimism, particularly in the West, a sense that, you know, at last the Arab world was going to uh, overthrow all these autocracies, embrace democracy, that this would bring all sorts of good things in its wake, that the economies would open up, that societies would be freer, and that the Arab world, which had been kind of shut out of a lot of the modernization, of uh, other societies was, was finally kind of joining the global game, if you like. Now, in retrospect, uh, I think that was clearly quite naive because perhaps we assumed, or too many commentators assumed, that, you, that once, you overthrow a democ once you overthrow an autocracy or a dictatorship, you can just kind of move almost effortlessly to a democracy, that it was a sort of default system and that it would just work quite easily. But actually, it's a really difficult transition, as we've discovered. And if you look at a country like Egypt, which is a place where 40% of the population is illiterate, uh, where you have, obviously, very powerful fundamentalist religious movements, it was a very unpromising ground for, for a democratic transition. And again, perhaps we were lulled by, I think, what was in retrospect, a false analogy with Europe. A lot of people said, oh, this is their Berlin Wall moment, and they're going to make this transition. But if you look at the countries of Eastern Europe, they, they had a lot more going for them than, uh, than the Egypts, the Libyas, and so on. They were relatively much richer. They had pre-existing democratic traditions, some of them, so that the Czech Republic had been a democracy in the past. They had a kind of tradition they could fall back on. And they also had the European Union, which worked with these countries for 10 years, very, very intensively, to reform their legal systems, to give them financial incentives, to keep them on the road. Before, with the incentive that you will eventually join the European Union. And I think that was all uh, incredibly helpful, and it meant that the democratic transitions in Europe worked relatively well, although even there, actually, if you were to go to Bulgaria or Romania now, these are not model democracies. There's quite a lot of backsliding. Hungary, the same. So that just proves even in rich, uh, comfortable Europe, it's pretty hard to make a move from an autocratic system to a democratic system. In the Arab world, it's so far, it's proved beyond them. And not only have we now got Egypt going back to essentially a military regime, which is what they threw off, you've got chaos uh, in, in uh, many other countries. Libya, despite the military intervention, or perhaps because in some ways of it, the overthrow of Gaddafi, a hideous regime. One shouldn't uh, make any bones about that, but the country is pretty chaotic. Uh, if you go to uh, Syria, obviously, is, is the, the worst case of all. Something like 100,000 people have died. The war grinds on. It's, uh, neither side looks capable of finishing it by actually winning. Both sides uh, seem determined to fight to the finish. Refugees pouring over the borders, destabilizing Jordan and Lebanon. Iraq, actually, looking really pretty terrible now with the resurgence of terrorism there. Um, Al-Qaeda, which we thought had been vanquished, coming back. And the levels of political killings in Iraq are now close to the levels in 2008, which was the peak of, of violence there. And there are other things that could go wrong, too. I mean, in Saudi Arabia, the king is now 90. And uh, if he were to die, there's a potential for a power struggle there, uh, which would suck the, the Gulf states into it. And I said, well, you know, in what sense is all this relevant to us? It's relevant to us as human beings, of course, because nobody wants to witness this uh, sort of horror on the, on the edges of Europe. But will it affect our lives? 
I mean, I think one of the interesting things about what's been going on in the Arab world and all the headlines that it's generated is that it's been happening concurrent with a resurgence in uh, equity markets in the West. Uh, so people don't actually feel that it's, it's bad news necessarily for the global economy, and it tells you how unconnected these countries are, how insignificant they are to the global economy. Indeed, that is part of their problem. However, I think if, you, if you're worrying about economics and business, the moment to really start panicking, or at least being seriously concerned, is when the dangers were spread to the Gulf. Because these are uh, economies that are systemically important to the global economy. Obviously, Saudi Arabia, the world's largest oil producer. Also, the Gulf states, which are big sources of capital, big investors. And you saw hints that they were getting sucked in when Bahrain began to have uh, serious instability, which the Saudis essentially crushed. Um, and now, if you go to a place like Dubai or uh, you know, Qatar, it feels like it's a million miles away from the chaos in Syria, but it isn't, actually. It's, it's, it's part of the same cultural space, and these countries are players in the conflict. Qatar, particularly, uh, has been funding the rebels and so on. So at the point where they get sucked into it, I think that's, that's when the red light starts flashing. However, having poured a lot of gloom on you, I think there are now some hopeful, a few hopeful signs in the Middle East. Uh, two in particular I would point to. One is that uh, Obama and the president of Iran, Rouhani, had this historic phone call, and I think it's fair to call it historic, uh, at, last, at the end of last week. It's the first time the leaders of the US and Iran have spoken since the Iranian Revolution of 1979. Now, it's a long way from there to getting to a nuclear deal, and um, once they get talking about the details, I suspect both sides will find the other side demanding far more than they're prepared to give. But they do both have a strong incentive to reach a deal. The Iranian economy has really suffered from sanctions. They're kind of on their knees, and particularly because they've got the sanctions and the effect of the war in Syria next door to deal with. And Obama, it's his last term. He wants a historic achievement. He really does not want another war in the Middle East. That's been an absolutely central theme of what he's doing. So if he can pull it off, he'll, he'll, he'll do his best. And I think the other positive development, which was a near disaster, is this agreement to inspect chemical weapons in Syria. If you think back, and again, it's a sign of how rapidly things can move. Three or four weeks ago, Obama was heading for a political meltdown. He'd said, he threatened these strikes, then he'd decided that he was going to go to Congress. It was pretty clear he was going to lose that vote in Congress. And if he had lost it, it would have been very, very serious for his presidency. I think it, it might have, terminal's a strong word, but he would have been extremely damaged with three years to go. And it would have been very damaging for American credibility around the world, because people would have said, Look, if the American president threatens military force, and you know, there are 200 American military bases around the world underpinning the global security system, if we can no longer believe when the American president says, you know, we're going to go in there and do something that he's, he, he can deliver, all sorts of things would have begun to be recalculated. So that was the situation they were heading for, this very uh, dangerous threat to American credibility. And then, bizarrely, Obama's bacon is saved by none other than Vladimir Putin coming up with this... Uh, suggesting that Syria disarm, and crucially, obviously, twisting the Syrians' arm hard enough to get them to agree to it, and we now have UN weapons inspectors going in, and who knows whether they'll be able to s completely deliver on the agreement. I'm sure Assad will try to wriggle out of it in some ways, but it's got Obama off the political hook that he was on, and it has opened a possible kind of template for an international approach to Syria, because one of the reasons nothing's been happening is that the Russians and the Americans cannot agree on, on how, to, how to deal with this. And because they're two key members of the UN Security Council, you can't get anything through the UN, and you can't get uh, them putting pressure on their respective proxies, so nothing's happened. If the Russians and the Americans can start working together, then it's possible that you'll begin to get some positive movement on Syria. So that's the Middle East. But uh, as I say, sitting here in Europe, that can feel uh, a long way away. The Euro crisis is uh, an interesting one, and I, in a way, Spain is a, is a great place to, to consider it, because Spain has been one of the countries that I think has been hit hardest, and in a way, it's one of the sort of sad... It's gone from, I think, being the most uplifting and exciting story in Europe to, to one of the saddest stories, because for the, the transformation in, in Spain in our lifetimes from... Uh, a dictatorship to a democracy from a relatively poor country to a relatively rich one to a country with a lot of excitement about the future. Um, 
made it made Spain a, a really kind of uplifting place to visit in recent in recent years. It was probably the, I thought the most optimistic place in Europe. And now, after five years of this, you can sense the sort of Spanish faith in the future draining away. And I'll be really interested to hear what the Spanish economist has to say when he comes later this afternoon. But um, you know, I took so I was here sort of six months ago talking to people in the finance ministry and business, and it was really depressing, actually. It was kind of a sense that they couldn't see a way out. Leaving the euro didn't seem like a solution because of the chaos it would cause. But uh, unemployment, if, for those of you that don't know the figures, is really sh shocking. It's 50% uh, youth unemployment, 23% general unemployment. Um, and you know, that's obviously the sign of a very sick society. Um, that said, uh, I arrived here yesterday, went to see the greatest authority in town, who, of course, the FT bureau chief, and um, had, had lunch with him. And he was uh, working on a story which is saying that the Spanish economy is actually beginning to revive a bit. There's been a surge in exports, which is what they need to try to correct the current account deficit. The banks are looking a bit better. So things might pick up. But behind that, I think there's a broader political question about the euro and the future of the euro which is, I think, that what the financial crisis has done is it's revealed that what a lot of people, such as Michael Portillo, for example, argued that, uh, that the euro was structurally flawed because you couldn't have a common currency area without much more political union behind it. There's probably something in that, to, to put it mildly. And to give you an example of, of what I'm talking about, the US obviously has a, a federal government, not working too well at the moment, as we were just saying, but they do have one. And it backs up the common currency. And so the federal budget represents about 20% of American GDP. The EU's central budget, much as we complain about waste and so on, it represents about 1% of EU GDP. And that means that the amount of money that you can kind of shuffle around through government to sort of even out the cycles in the economy is really, really small. And so you don't have a way of cushioning the shocks from one produ less productive area to to more productive areas and so on. And so the Euro skeptics, actually, and the Euro Federalists tended to agree on this point, that this couldn't go on, that eventually uh, you would have to move to a much larger central government to have a, a, a real backing for the, for the common currency. The difference between the skeptics and the Federalists is the Federalists thought that was a great idea, and the skeptics thought that was a terrible idea, and that was why they opposed the single currency in the first place. <laughs> But I think the interesting point we've reached now is that although people can see that's necessary, the question is, is it politically feasible in Europe? And it's been really, really interesting for me to go to Germany quite a lot in the last couple of years and to see the shift in attitude there because the Germans were traditionally the most uh, kind of heartfelt Euro-Federalists but for obvious historical reasons. They were less kind of keen on the nation state. They were very wary of nationalism. There was a way for Germany to kind of recreate Europe in a way that they felt more comfortable with was to head to something like a United States of Europe, a phrase if you use in Europe, you, in Britain, you know, no politician would say that they, they wanted that. It's a complete political no-no. In Germany, that was kind of motherhood and apple pie. That's what everybody wanted, to, uh, at least in theory. But I think what's happened is that during the Euro crisis, the Germans have discovered that actually that political union will come with an enormous price tag for them. What they've been willing reluctantly, but willing so far to do, is to sign up to one-off bailouts, you know, that you'll give some money to Greece, but it'll be a loan, and eventually, at least in theory, it will be paid back. And that's been hard enough. I mean, the Germans have committed the equivalent of an entire year's federal budget to various bailout schemes in Europe. So the idea that the Germans have done nothing is not the case. But the next step, this move towards a big federal budget and a permanent transfer union, I don't actually see the Germans being ready to do that um, because they would feel that they're signing up to basically for the German taxpayer to permanently subsidize Southern Europe. And that's not a proposition that Angela Merkel feels she can sell to her electorate or indeed one that she wants to sell to her electorate. So although if you go to Brussels, there's still a kind of assumption that, yeah, we know the direction we're eventually heading to, we'll get to this political union, we'll have a banking union first, and then we'll have a common taxation policy, and uh, that's, that's the way it's all laid out. If you talk to the Germans, I don't get the sense they're really up for that, and they are the most powerful country in Europe, much more so, really, than when this crisis began. It's now 
really clear that Berlin is, is where the decision, the crucial decisions have to be taken. And so that's the big unanswered question about the political question about the euro. We've seen the economy, it's not great by any means, but it's, it's, it's less frightening than it was than when I made my panicked phone call home in Greece. But the big political questions are yet to be resolved. And actually, at some point, I'd really like to hear what Michael thinks about that, because you wrote a piece for The Times, I think, saying that Britain should leave the European Union because it was heading for in, inexorably for political union. And I, as, as you gather, I, I, I'm not so sure that actually they'll ever make it to that political union, but it's a really interesting debate to be had. Um, the last area I'd like to talk about is one that's really not uh, relatively neglected in Europe, although George obviously touched upon it, and that's East Asia. And um, the rise of China and its implications. And I talked earlier about, well, we've got to think about which of these political developments are systemically important? Which of the ones can really change our lives? And I think, actually, historically, it, it has to be the rise of China, more than anything that happens in the Middle East, uh, because of the sheer size of the economies involved, the size of the countries involved. Uh, the Middle East is, what, 600 million people, all told. China alone is 1.2 billion. India is another 1.2 billion. And these are, these are the giants of the future. And things are moving there politically in ways that aren't necessarily um, entirely sort of, uh, they don't make you entirely optimistic. But the background is the economic shift. The, in 2011, China became the second largest economy in the world, overtaking Japan. And that's become an enormous source of uh, tension, really, between the Chinese and the Japanese, who have a lot of unfinished historical business. Uh, there's enormous resentment against Japan in China because of the wars of the 1930s and the way in which the, Jap the Japanese, I think the Chinese are correct to say, haven't really acknowledged what they did in, in China and the rest of East Asia. But generally, there would be tension anyway between two big neighboring economies at a time when momentum is moving between them. The political system is, of course, very different. Japan, a democracy closely allied to the United States, China not a democracy, and the US is only real, plausible geopolitical rival. Um, and so the potential for tension between those two countries has been there for a long time. But it's now really reaching close to boiling point. And that's, I think, because there's been changes in, in the politics of both countries. China really, uh, for the first 20, 25 years after Deng Xiaoping opened things up, pursued a very intelligent foreign policy, which was essentially to keep quiet. Deng had this phrase about hide your light, don't claim leadership, concentrate on the economy, build your strength up. And they, they're, they're not stupid. They could see that you know, for, the, for the United States or Europe, the idea of the rise of China was potentially very disturbing uh, because of the size of the country, its system, and so on. And so they did their utmost not to frighten the horses, not to make claims. <coughs> However, that seems to have changed, or well, it has changed in the last couple of years. And whether that's because you have a new generation coming to power, whether it's because the Chinese are feeling more confident because uh, their economy is now so large and they've also seen the troubles in the US post Lehman, there are all sorts of explanations for why Chinese behavior has changed. But it does appear to have changed in the sense that they are now prepared to risk uh, confrontations with their various neighbors. Um, because the fact is that China actually has a whole load of outstanding territorial disputes with really everyone. It has a territorial dispute with Vietnam, with the Philippines, with India, um, and, and with Japan. And until recently, they haven't really, Deng had this phrase that, you know, our generation is not wise enough to settle these things, we'll think about them later. Um, but now they're beginning to put the pressure on. They uh, managed to, uh, ridiculously, a lot of these things are about uninhabited rocks in the water. Uh, now, why people care about them is an interesting question. Some people say it's because there's oil underneath them. But I think often it's to do with face and to do with national prestige. The, the idea that another country might grab these things, particularly for a country like China that's been colonized in the past, is not something they, they feel they can tolerate. And they feel they'll get hammered at home by public opinion, which is very nationalist and expresses itself through the internet. Anyway, for whatever reason, They've had a confrontation with the Philippines and done quite well and managed to grab this little shoal of rocks, Scarborough Shoal, quite recently, which has alarmed people. But the big one is with uh, Japan. There are these islands, variously known to the Japanese as the Senkakus, known to the Chinese as the Diyu. And um, who did what is, of course, a 
question of propaganda on both sides. Both sides say the other one has attempted to change the status quo. But the result is that they have been both been sending naval ships into the arena. They've been buzzing each other's planes. A few months ago, the Chinese actually locked their missile guidance system onto a J Japanese warship, which is the stage before you fire. Um, so this is really big stuff, potentially. I think that, again, nobody thinks, well, not nobody, but most people think that they're not crazy enough to actually want a war. They can see what's at stake. But the, the risk is miscalculation. Because if you have all these planes and ships buzzing around each other, the chances of a captain or <laughs> making a miscalculation, somebody firing, and then you're in a major international crisis is really quite high. And the Americans are very, very concerned because they're implicated in this because they have a security treaty with Japan and they have said that it covers the Senkaku Islands. So it's, at least in theory, if a conflict breaks out between China and Japan, the Americans are in, and then you're, you're really talking about World War III. So um, that is something that is not covered much in the European press, but really should be. Um, now, how the Americans would actually react uh, is an interesting question. I was talking to a Japanese diplomat about this only uh, last week, and I said, are you totally confident that if the Chinese attack, the Americans would be in? And he said, yeah, they'll be in. And uh, I was talking to Americans about it, uh, who were involved with this, and they said, you know, we're not crazy. We, we, we're not looking for a war with, with China, and there would be ways of getting out of this. But it would be a very, very difficult situation. And it's incidentally one of the reasons people were looking very hard at what America would do over Syria, because when Obama says there's a red line, and if you cross this red line, I will act, there are, the whole global security system is basically drawn around American red lines, whether it's in the Gulf or in Japan, they are the predominant military power. And so the Japanese, for example, are very interested in, well, how is Obama going to play Syria? Can we trust him on this? And Obama has to think very hard about this because, unfortunately, a lot of the American uh, military guarantees have to be a form of bluff. Um, they, they, the Chinese have to believe that there's at least a chance that America would come in. Otherwise, they might take a, take a chance and take on the... the the Japanese. And the Americans have to sort of, at the back of their minds, think, well, if the worst happens, maybe we can get out of it, we can negotiate a way out of it. But it's a very tense and unstable situation. And the last thing before I conclude is that I said that the historic moment was when uh, China overtook Japan and became the second largest economy in the world. Well, in a few years' time, some say 2018, some say 2020, China will become probably the world's largest economy. Uh, the Economist, in fact, has a rather clever little ready reckoner on, on its website where you can feed in various assumptions about rates of growth and so on, but it's around then. And that will really be a historic moment because the US has been the world's largest economy since about 1880. We've uh, got used to the idea that the world's largest economy is a democratic nation, a Western nation. Psychologically, it will be a big moment when China uh, becomes the biggest economy in the world. And also, in terms of raw power, uh, even though China certainly has all sorts of political and economic problems to deal with, it's been growing at a, quite a lick for some 30 years. It's not going to, I think, don't think we're going to wake up at some point and think, oh, well, you know, what were we thinking? That was all a mirage. The rise of China is absolutely for real, and it's going to define the next 20 years or so. So the last thought I'd leave you with is that although those foreign pages that I mentioned at the beginning are usually full of the Middle East or Europe, the big historic shift remains what's happening in East Asia and the rise of China. And the big question, and the one that certainly would affect all our lives, is can this be done peacefully? Is there a way that the US and China, very different countries, can manage this transition from a world in which America is the world's sole superpower to one in which China is at least the world's largest economy, although not quite for quite a while as advanced militarily as the US. Is there a way we can move to this new world of a duopoly uh, in a peaceful way in which the global economy keeps growing and of course China and the US remain deeply independent econo interdependent economically? Or is at some point the power dynamic actually going to create a conflict? And if it does, what happens to this globalized world that we're all used to. So I'll leave you with that question, but perhaps we can try and answer it later in some of the discussions. Michael, thank you very much.